before we start could we start with a small prayer and then we'll go on sure. father we thank you we praise you we adore you we worship you jesus we adore you we worship you we exalt you we magnify you holy spirit we adore you we magnify you we exalt you thank you father for sending your only son having so much of love on us and by his sheer obedience to your word and when he got ascension back to you you sent us a great comforter teacher the holy spirit as we are going to encounter this pentecost in the post easter resurrection period teach us holy spirit today more about you more about your breath of life more about how to find and how to search the unseen through the light of the word and how you are going to switch on things which are switched off which the human mankind cannot do it by the power of you and thank you holy spirit and thank you lord for opening all our hearts and thank you holy spirit that you have filled all of us with your wisdom and the strength to put those instructions into practice to reflect the light of yours inside us to others and to be the salt to those people in their life who are tasteless and to be a good samaritan for people who are injured who are neglected who are vulnerable we thank you and we praise you in the glorious name of jesus amen amen and amen Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And um, a small testimony here from Ireland, I hope. And from there on, we will take on, brother. Is that okay, brother Linus? Please, please go ahead, brother. Please praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So beautiful, brother, to have you here. And all of us are excited here this morning. <clears throat> praise God. No, brother, it, it was a surprise package, brother Johnson put me. <laughs> Early an hour ago. Yes, yes. Definitely, it's always surprise, brother. Praise God. We have to be prepared. <clears throat> Praise God. And that, the Holy Spirit is always there to help us and guide us. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and uh, Anne Marie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Brother Amel. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, hi everyone. My name is Anne Marie, and I'm from Ireland, and I'm just here to share my testimony of my son amazing testimony um well not just for my son for myself as well the gifts that we've received from god and um, so basically when my son was born he was born perfect he was the absolute perfect baby and at seven weeks old he got a chest infection and we didn't think anything of it we just thought a normal chest infection as kids get and when that chest infection went away, two weeks later, he would get another chest infection and so on. It would come every two weeks. And after, every time the chest infection would come, he would remain, he would get sicker and sicker and sicker every time. And he got so sick that it was leading to intensive care all the time. So... After a few really bad doses of intensive care, they thought, right, something isn't adding up. These chest infections are not normal. So they ran a lot of tests and they just done everything. Physical wise, he was still perfect. And after a few tests, they just said, look, we can't seem to see anything that's wrong. So in the meantime, the chest infections kept recurring and was getting worse and worse. And in the meantime, my son was just deteriorating. And there was once where he was so sick 
that he was just in the hospital bed and his heart rate was at 180. And I remember calling the nurse and I said, this isn't normal. My son is deteriorating in front of me. His heart rate is 180. These cannot be normal chest infections. There has to be something not right. So at four months old, we were sent to a hospital where this guy would go down his airway with a camera and he came back to say, no, there's nothing wrong. I've checked it all. So praise God, there was nothing wrong. But in the meantime, these chest infections kept coming back and worse and worse and worse. They were getting really scary. So as time went on, he became 10 months old and he couldn't eat anymore because eating was causing a lot of issues, which they couldn't figure out why. So he had to be tube fed for a long time. So at 10 months old, we were sent up to Crum Crumlin in Dublin for further investigation. And when we got up there, the guy that looked at my son at four months old went down his airway and he said, I'm going to go down and have another look. And I remember saying, but you'd already looked and there was nothing there. He said, look, I'm just going to have another look just to make sure. So at 10 months old, he went back down and he came back to me and he said, I found the problem. So I said, good. I said, what is it? So he said, what's actually happening is, he said, it's not chest infections that your son is getting. He said, he's actually smothering in his own food. When he was drinking his milk and eating his food, it was going straight to his lungs. So he was actually smothering in his own food. So his lungs were always full, full, full in x-rays and they could never figure out what they were full of, but they were full of food. So he couldn't breathe most of the time. He was on oxygen and heated oxygen and BiPAP machines and nothing was helping. So they stopped all food and he had to be tube fed because it was the safer option at the time. So then they had to do an operation to close up the hole in his airway. And we thought, right, brilliant. This is this is him finished he's okay now so they closed up the airway and they didn't feed him for a while again because they didn't think it was safe to do so for a while so they kept food away from him for a long time and at the time it came to take out the tube he hadn't remember how to eat so he forgot how to eat in the meantime so the tube feed had to go on for that bit longer and he had to be taught how to eat again so that was fine. At 11 months old, I found after he'd come out of the operation with his, when he got his airway done, I found his hands and legs were starting to go very weak and they were starting to turn in. And bear in mind, this was a child that was standing up ready to walk and he'd lost the ability to stand. So I remember saying one day, his legs don't look right and his hands aren't doing what they used to do. So I said, there's something not adding up. So at 11 months old, this, this guy had come in and he said, look, he said, we've done a lot of tests on your son and everything seems good, but I want to do another, just one more test on him. So I said, okay, not thinking anything of it just thought everything would be okay. And he did a test, it's to check the muscles and the nerves in, in his hands and legs. So they did the test and the next day, this guy had come back into the room in the hospital and he said, hi Anne-Marie, he said, are you on your own? My partner had gone to the shop the same day for a walk and he said, are you on your own? And I said, no, I said, no, I said, his dad has gone to the shop for a walk. And he said, have you got any support with you? And at that moment, I just knew something wasn't right. So I said, you can come in and you can sit down and we can talk. And he said, no, 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 I think you need to ring Charlie's dad to come back. So I said, OK. So I rang his dad to come back and this man came into the room and he'd said, 
Look, he said, I have something to tell you and it's not good news. So I said, okay, still, still okay because not knowing what he was going to, going to say and thought whatever he does say, we'll fix this. So he came in and he said, I think, we think your child has SMARD, S-M-A-R-D. So at that moment I thought, what is that? So he said, look, basically the only advice I can give you he said, is go home and enjoy your son while you have him. So at that moment, I just went numb. And I couldn't even speak. I just said, like, no, I said, this, this isn't right. No way. And he said, look, go home and enjoy him while you have him. Because they only live till they're 18 months old with this disease. So I said, oh, no, I was just numb. I didn't know what to do. And I said to him, does he... 100% have this he said look we're after sending bloods to America to find out the definite that he has it but we're 99% he has it I said so you don't know till the results come back he said yes and I said look I said can you please I said put me out of my misery now and tell me does my son have this diagnosis so he said yes and I'm very sorry so I said right so he went away and we went home and on this was on a Friday and on the Monday I had a meeting in our own hospital in Cork and I had a meeting with 10 consultants 10 consultants would have been everybody that he was under respiratory neurology dietitian speech and language everybody you could name was there and I was so scared going to that meeting that day because I knew there was things going to be said that I didn't want to hear. So I remember going into the room and everybody greeted me with, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I thought, I can't, I can't do this. So I sat down and I said to, they all had their say and they said, look, we're really sorry. You've got a, such a tough road ahead and we'll make the most, we'll make happy times for him and I remember just standing up and I pointed at every single person in the room and I said you're all wrong I said my son doesn't have this and you're all wrong and one of them turned around and she said to me listen she said this is about the child it's not about you she said you need to stop being in denial and accept what this think of the child and I said, excuse me, listen here now. I said, I will never accept this. This isn't what my child has. So like everything else, they just looked as if this one is going mad. You know, I just was not accepting it. So I went home and I just, I remember saying to my partner, like, what are we going to do? Like, I would not accept this diagnosis. I just kept saying, he does not have this, he does not have this, he does not have this. But in the back of my head was telling me, look, maybe he does because look how many people are telling you professional-wise that he does, but still not accepting what they had said. So a week, two weeks went by and I had a knock at my door and it was this guy and he said, hi, can I come in? I'm from CUH, the hospital. So I said, yeah, come in, come in. And he put, his ha he put his hand on my child's head and he said, oh, you poor thing, you've got a tough road ahead. And I, I remember saying to him, excuse me, don't greet him like that. And he said to me, I said, who are you and what are you here for? So he said, Anne-Marie, he said, I'm very sorry, but I'm palliative care. <clears throat> and I said, why are you at my house? He said, I'm here because when the time comes, I need to make your son comfortable. And I got so upset and angry. That's when it really hit hard when I thought this palliative care program were involved. So I thought, I just said to him, get out of my house, get out. When you bring so much negative with you like that, just get out of my house, please, and don't come back anymore. So he said, look, you're being very in denial. You need to be strong for your child. I said, no, I'm not accepting this. Just leave my house. And at this time, I actually didn't know Brother Amal at the time. And 
I didn't know much about the word of God and I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about it all and I didn't know Brother Amel. But at that time, the only option and the only person I had was God. I thought, you're the only one that can help me in this situation because there's no cure out there for this disease and I am not losing my son. So he was the only person I had. So in the meantime, we still had to wait 12 weeks for these bloods to come back, even though they said he does have it. But there was a voice in my head telling me, but the bloods didn't come back. And there is that 1% that I know God can probably help me, give me that hope. So that was fine. The 12 weeks went by. They were the toughest 12 weeks of my life. And I remember the exact day of the 12 weeks I got a phone call from my son's dad to say, are you having a good day? And I said, not really. I said, but you know, what's going on? And he just said, I have just had a phone call from the doctor in CUH. The bloods have come back. Our son doesn't have SMARD. S-M-A-R-D, he does not have it. And I remember just falling to my knees and I just cried and cried and cried, happy tears. And I just looked up. I said, you're really there. One percent I had and you've given it to me. You're there and I know you were listening to me. You were the only person that I had that I could rely on. And you you've came true. You've came true. So that was fine. Palliative care never called anymore. Nobody called anymore. It was just amazing. I just my prayer was answered there and then. And a few weeks later, I had another appointment with the neurologist. And she said, oh, look, she said, it's great news that he doesn't have it. And I said, I told you all that he didn't, but you didn't believe me. And they're just, they were absolutely shocked. Now, at the mo- at that time, I did- didn't know Brother Amel. But what I did learn was the Holy Spirit was with me and I never knew. So there and then, I just knew he was, he was with me all the time and I didn't realize it. So as... At that meeting with the neurologist, she said to me, look, it's great news that he doesn't have this diagnosis, but there is something going on. And I remember looking up again, saying, God, whatever is going on, I I know you're going to help me and I know you're going to heal my son. But what is it, you know? And a few weeks went by and we got a diagnosis of my son having a missing gene that causes weaknesses to the hands and the legs. In the meantime, my son is eating everything. The tube isn't used anymore. He's eating everything. I was told that he would never walk. He would never talk. He would never eat. He would never do this. He would never do that. Never use his hands, never use his legs. And he would die at 18 months old. He is to fight all the odds. Thank you, Jesus. It's Jesus that has done it. He is to fight all the odds. He's now eating again. He's having a full-blown conversation. He would literally tell you where to go. He knows everything. And he sings songs. He's now going to school. He's four years of age now. He's now going to school. He absolutely loves it. He has so much friends. And we got a diagnosis when he was two and a half. And the diagnosis we got was distal SMA phenotype five it's called and it basically causes a weakness to the hands and the legs so they told me he'll never walk so that was fine two years ago we found brother Amel and how like how we found brother Amel was we'd met these friends in the hospital three years ago and our dog went missing And the person that found our dog was this person that we'd met in the hospital three years ago. And this person had brought us to meet Amal. And we're with Amal two years later now. And Amal brought us to the Holy Spirit. And the changes in my son's life since I met Amal is just phenomenal. Like they said, he'd never walk. And 
for now he's in a wheelchair at the moment but if you saw the differences in his hands and his legs and I know praise God my son is going to walk in the next 12 months the differences in him and for anybody listening like I can send Amal videos of him on a bike of him using his hands and you would never ever think that this is the child that they spoke about because I know God had different plans for him praise God praise be to Jesus Anne-Marie um, Anne-Marie the importance is, uh, in the initial diagnosis, they said the gene is missing. Oh, yes. Yes, that piece. Yes. They, and then what was that... the prayer you are making? What was the scripture you used? How often did you yeah. use? And just that process alone, please. Okay. So they told me that basically what he has is there's a missing gene in his body called the GARS gene. It's not there. And a few weeks back, I got a phone call from a top genetic doctor in Dublin. And he said to me on the phone, I said, can you explain about this gene to me? So he said, yes. He said, the gene is there, but it's just switched off. And I said, say that again. He said, the gene is there, but it's just switched off. I said, but I thought the gene was gone. The gene wasn't there. He said, no, no, the gene is there but it just needs to be switched on. And I remember looking up against him, praise God, because this gene wasn't there. And now it is, it needs to be switched on. So that's what, that's what I'm praying with, with the moment to switch that gene on and get the hands and legs going even more than they already are. So praise God. And the prayer that I, when I met Amal, Amal is absolutely fantastic. And the Holy Spirit have brought us to Amal, but Amal has brought us to the Holy Spirit even more and more. And he's just amazing. Amal the, is born, the bald and a zero. Amal did nothing. Amal just gave you the truth, Anne-Marie. Go ahead. Amal, Amal is amazing. Amazing. And he takes no credit for what he does. He's absolutely fantastic. And God must be just beaming over him all the time for the great work that he does. He's just amazing. But the, the prayer that I do, that Amal had given us first day, and I could say this a hundred times a day, and I'm so used to saying it now that I just literally say it all day long in my head, and I don't even realize it. It just goes on all day long, long, and I just, I just, I enjoy saying it because I see what it's doing already. But the, the prayer that Amal had given me was, the spirit of the Lord is upon Charlie. My God himself has anointed Charlie. He has filled Charlie with his love and he has set Charlie completely free. Satan and the demons have no power over Charlie. Charlie has the body and the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Anne-Marie, for coming on board. And um... No problem, Mel. Thank you. Now, how, how old is Charlie now? Charlie is four and four. he is absolutely healing every day. Praise every be to day, Jesus. praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Every single day, he's just, you would never put this child to what they had said. God had Amen. different plans. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And praise all name, you, fame Brother and glory Amen. be to the Trinity. And thank you, thank you, Anne Marie, for coming on board to glorify God. You're welcome, Amel. Thank you very much for everything you do. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. My dear brothers and sisters, this is this is another testimony through which the Lord began to teach me. This is a genetic disorder. When this initially they said that this gene is missing, because this gene is missing, he cannot use both of his arms and both of his legs. That is a major hurdle. When Anne Marie begins to speak the scripture for nearly eight or nine months, then came the blood result to say, Oh no, now the gene is there, but the gene is switched off. 
So now, is there any treatment for the gene to be switched on? There is no treatment. Whereas, there is a treatment in the word of God, and that's what the mother is speaking now. And this is what happens to every one of us. And this is what the Lord has been teaching us today. Quickly, we'll go to the Gospel of John, um, chapter 6, verse number uh, 1 onwards, please. Okay. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming unto him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he knew he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad which have who has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number of 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as many as they would. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, and that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, filled the twelve baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, and which remained over and above unto them that they had eaten. Then, thank you, Lord. Thank you. This is, this is a very commonly and more often, we might have studied this uh, Gospel of John, chapter 6. And that is a great insight the Holy Spirit is teaching us today. The first question comes here today is, when the whole crowd is coming unto Jesus, Jesus wants to feed them. That is the first inference the Holy Spirit gives us today. Whenever people come unto him, he wants to feed them. The question, it's, it's a process of a discipleship. What you and I are expected today to be the servant of the Most High God. He literally, he asked Philip that how much would it cost? It is just to test him. The question was asked to Philip, but here, who is responding to the call is Andrew. So the first quality of a disciple is to search. Though the question being asked to Philip, Andrew, it is St. Andrew who took it on board. And, sister, can you give me the sixth verse, sister, please? Yeah. So, sorry, the eighth sixth was, verse, right, brother? Yes, yeah, sister, uh, sorry, the eighth verse. Can you go a little more down, please? One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad 
who has five lo- barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? So the first thing, the question being asked to Philip, but it was St. Andrew who got into the act. Though it was commissioned and expected out of Philip, the first process of feeding the 5,000 begins with searching. The first process that happened in Brother Johnson's life is also he began to search inside this scripture. The first step of a discipleship, when he begins to search in Christ Jesus, search in the word, the Lord begins to reveal many things for him. The next thing is, he has to find a lad who have five barley loaves and two small fishes among a crowd of more than 5,000 men alone. Is that an easy job? Don't know. Definitely, it cannot be a straightforward one. But he did not lose heart. He went on in his search to find one person and that too, that person is willing to give what he has. The first, the first thing of a discipleship in Christ Jesus is, am I ready to give it to him? The next thing is searching. The second thing is, am I ready to give what I have for my Lord? And that is another and that is another beautiful quality of a discipleship is, am I ready to give away what I have? It can be my time. It can be my resources. It can be my expertise. Anything for the Lord. But the question reminds in Andrew was, how much, what is it going to do? Just of five barley loaves and two small fishes. Sometimes we too are in the same boat like St. Andrew. We say, Asha, look, I have only this much. What am I be able to do? What am I able to do only with this? I, of course, I cannot sing. Of course, I cannot do these things. But when a person could able to draw something beautiful, as we are all getting it from Sister Shamini's uh, son and daughter, isn't that giving us a great insight into the scripture? Yes. So every small talent given by God can be used to him. He has the capacity, the ability to multiply. How? That is his problem. The next thing is, the next quality of a disciple is, Jesus said, make the men to sit down. After searching, after ready to give what we have, the third thing Jesus is asking a disciple is make the people to sit before me. Make everyone to sit before my word, before my presence. Now, if we go into the first and second verse, the crowd came in because he has healed so many. It is for the healing. And the, and, the, and, the, and the other beautiful thing of this passage is, of the scripture is, Jesus never spoke anything. Jesus never gave any teaching for them. But the teaching itself is inside this beautiful parable, this beautiful history. So the people who came for healing, are they ready to sit down? Like even today, the same trend comes. As Brother Johnson always says, what, when is the healing time? What time do you do the healing and everything? The same was the mindset of those people in those days as well. But the question is, when you and I as a disciple of Christ is making people to sit down before Jesus, before the word, before the light, they are sitting down. Why? Because they are expecting a healing. 
they are expecting a deliverance they are expecting a uh, some breakthrough in their life and that's why this crowd came in but then even at that moment neither andrew nor philip not simon peter none of the disciples knew what jesus is going to do but he was following the orders given by christ jesus so the fourth quality of a disciple is taking the instructions literally from jesus from the word what the word is going to do it will do its own job but my job as a disciple is am i following the instructions the instruction given to jesus given by jesus to the disciples is make the men sit down are we doing are we making people to sit down before the word before christ and jesus took the loaves when and when he had given thanks he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were sat down and like wise of the fishes as much as as they would now the next question comes here the 12th verse says when they were filled he said to his disciples so the next thing is whoever approach jesus he is giving them for their belly full whoever came unto jesus he was ready to fill their heart but imagine just 12 disciples serving 5000 would that be a tiresome job but it kept going they were not tired they were not fragile they were more agile and able to serve them why because when you and i as a disciple of christ jesus is following the instruction given by lord by the lord the tiredness the the fragileness or the even the extreme fatigue will not come and overwhelm us as we all today we are seeing with brother johnson even with a different time zone he is still able to comprehend be able to make the commitments which he has committed before the same times in different time zones though he is totally in a different area and that exactly the scripture is giving us today feeding the 5000 is always a matter of a discipleship am i ready to serve that task am i ready to do what he has asked me to do the next thing it is not to be over the mission is not over now the all who had eaten they are all gone away all who have eaten to their full they left the place they got what they wanted and they are leaving but it was the disciple to gather them together it is a disciple's character to wait until the lord gives them to wait on the lord for the next move that is the fifth quality of a disciple is to wait until the next instructions come from the lord here he says therefore when they were filled he said unto his disciples gather up the fragments that remain that nothing shall be lost and this is another an important characteristic feature of a disciple as we all are sharing the scriptures the truth to people many come many have their healing many got their deliverance many got their breakthrough but we need to wait the 12 remaining the 12 remaining are the one who is going to stay with Christ so when you and i are feeding a multitude of people given by god to feed them to make them to sit down before christ mind yourself it is not everybody will try to attach themselves with christ with the word and let us not take that into judgment either because jesus clearly said no one can come to me until until or unless my father has made him to come 
but to gather this five barley loaves and the remaining over unto them each head he said this is the beauty of collection the left over and it is through this 12 baskets of left over loaves of bre- bread and fish that this represents the 12 disciples the 12 apostles through which the whole world got the evangelization but there is a beautiful teaching jesus did it here it is a simple symbolical time it is a pre um, it is a pre presumptuous sorry it is a miniature of the passover a passover in which christ himself becomes the bread a passover in which christ is giving the crowd christ is giving the disciples i am this bread but he did it so subtly but did their disciples understand definitely not and this is the first time when jesus is giving his miniature a small pilot study of what he is going to do on the monday thursday when he gave thanks and he gave it to them and this is the work of the spirit of the lord dear brothers and sisters as we are traveling today in the time of approaching the pentecost this is the disciples did not understand the disciples did not comprehend the the disciples could not understand what jesus really wants to come across so this is one of the main characteristic features of the holy spirit example the holy spirit sanctifies us the so one of the major function of the holy spirit is sanctification quickly we will go to the book of acts chapter 9 of acts chapter 9 verse number 10 onwards please shall i read prabhu yes please sister go ahead yeah okay. from the first onwards And first onwards yeah go ahead yeah one one onwards okay yes please the conversion of saul and saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him saul saul why pers- persu- persecutest why are you persecuting me? me and he said who art thou lord and the lord said i am jesus who thou persecutest it is heard for thee to kick against the pricks and he trembling and he trembling and astonished said lord what wilt thou have me to do and the lord said unto him arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless hearing a voice but seeing no man and Saul arose from the earth and when his eyes were opened he saw no man but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus and he was 3 days without sight and neither did eat or drink 
And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananus, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananus, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tars Tarsus, for behold, he prayed and, and had seen in a vision a man named Ananus coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananus answered, Lord, I have heard, my, heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to, this, to thy saints at Jerusalem. Brother, tell me when I have to stop. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananus went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much. Praise God. This is another uh, another passage in the scripture which we might have been going through in many of the Life in the Spirit seminar and with Brother Johnson as well. We have time again. Um, we have discussed in detail. But there is a work of sanctification of, of this Holy Spirit. It clearly says Ananias was a disciple. And it, it clearly, it, it, yeah, the Bible clearly states, I think it is in the, in the time of, um, um, what is it? Yeah, Ananias. Yeah. yeah, the 10th verse. It clearly says that there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. But when the Lord is telling him to go and to pray over Saul, he, Ananias begin to give information to the Lord. Lord, you know yourself how much he has done damage to your church and to your own brethren. But the Lord said, no, I am here to give him my mission to the Gentiles. And always, and, and the Lord said right from the beginning that how much St. Paul has to suffer for him. That's why even in the sufferings of all his journey, whether in the Romans he is writing or in the passage of even when he is writing to, to Jude and to Philemon, all the sufferings because his mission to the, to the pagans and to the Gentiles is through suffering. But Ananias was very startled but most often when we study the scripture, it is the shell came, the shell fell down from the eyes of St. Paul when Ananias prayed over him. But the real truth, another, another truth, another mirror of image of another person's eyes be opened was Ananias. Not only the scales were removed from the eyes of St. Paul, but the scales in the heart of Ananias was also fell down because he was a man who thought 
that it is not right for him to go to Saul to pray. But when he got mistaken, the Holy Spirit could able to sanctify him. No, do not see him like that. So the shells of his heart fell down the time when he prayed over St. Paul, though the Bible says that the scales fell down from the eyes of St. Paul, the scales from the heart of Ananias also has been fell down to openly view people. This is one of the major functions of the Spirit of the Lord. And as the Pentecost is up fast approaching, sometimes even in our life, when we take a decision, when we take some, some motives with which we are starting it, the Holy Spirit, when we are open to the Holy Spirit, He always gives avenues and places and situations to sanctify us more and more and more in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 11, please. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. This sanctification being done by the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit did for Ananias, it can be done the Holy Spirit is always, always looking forward, always trying to sanctify us in Christ Jesus to him, to get more closer and more closer to him. Praise God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And this is one among, the other one is, um, another major function of the Holy Spirit, rather, another facet of the Holy Spirit would be, actually, He is the revelation. The Holy Spirit is the revelation from the Word of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you and I cannot interpret. You and I cannot understand the hidden secrets. And such is the testimony of Sister Anne-Marie when she came and told that I know that it was the Holy Spirit, but she couldn't put a name to it, to name to him when they, she was given all the negative outcome of in, in the life of her son. They said within 18 months, your son will be no more. And the system even sent palliative care people. But there was some voice inside her to say no. And she listened to that voice. And later on, when the word was spoken to her, when the truth was given, she, today she could able to say it was the Holy Spirit. And this revelation from the word, what we are doing today, what we are discussing today, it's a, always another revelation from the word of God by the Holy Spirit the steps involved in becoming a disciple of Christ. Okay. We'll go to Luke chapter 24. Please, Luke chapter 24, verse number 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Imos which was from Jerusalem, about three, three score furlongs. For longs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communi communications are these 
that you have one to another as you walk and are sad. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yeah, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the at the sepulchre. Spe sorry, brother. Sepulchre. Sepulchre. At the tomb. At the tomb. Yeah. And okay. When and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the tomb. tomb and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expound, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whether they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry, tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat, with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Amen. And Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God. This is another beauty. Here Jesus is explaining to those people, to the same disciples who spent three and a half years with him and yet they were not able to identify the word that is walking with them. The word is walking with them but they could not identify the word is speaking. But one thing they did, they insisted the word to stay with him for that night. They insisted that let the word Jesus stay with him with, him, with them overnight. Again, this miracle is happening in the life of these two disciples because they insisted that the word be staying in them in the place they are staying. In this negative, they were actually, the road to Emmaus is a negative experience because they did not obey what the Lord said. In fact, they were running out of fear but when the Lord, when they begin to walk with the word, when they insisted the word to stay with, him, with them, it, the word convicted them, convinced them, and communicated them one thing, go back. When the word 
came near to them, the same Passover experience, what we just studied in the Gospel of John chapter 6, came into their heart. They said, when he begins to open, when he begins to break the bread, they identified him. So to identify the word, to identify the, understand the word of God, it can be done only by the help of the Holy Spirit. So it is of ultimate importance that to study and to understand and to derive the power before the word and to get the nourishment, you and I need the Holy Spirit. That is why Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 16, he said, it is better for me to go. Only then he can stay with you. Only then I can send you the comforter. But even amidst of all the word being with them, the disciples were still saying in Luke 24, 21, again saying, we trusted that it is he who will redeem Israel from the Roman Empire. When? After viewing, after seeing, after traveling with Jesus for three and a half years. And this is the marvel of the work of the Holy Spirit. The same night, they took a decision to get back to Jerusalem. Imagine, they would have been tired after traveling. But when the word stayed in their heart, when the word convicted, when they saw the true bread of life, Christ Jesus, that convicted them to get back to their base as the Lord has commanded them. What are they doing? They are transferring their disobedience into obedience to Christ Jesus. And that is where they were able to understand how Christ has been giving the word and to explain them through the scriptures. So to understand the scripture itself, we need the work that we need the directions, we need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And another one major function of the Holy Spirit would be, he is the principal agent of evangelization. He is the principal agent of evangelization. The disciples did not went to go and evangelize. Yes, if you see Luke 10, 10, Luke 10, he says um, the disciples went down and cast out demons and everything. But evangelization to go and preach the gospel, to, the, to go and preach the word, to go and preach the truth, and to set the people free did happen only after the dissension of the, of, of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, please. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Praise God. Amen. Amen. No. Should I continue, brother? No, sister. Oh, thanks. Thanks, sister. So this power, after the disciples received this power, only then in the Acts of Apostles chapter 2, St. Peter, being a fisherman, you can see the amount of scripture he is, he is quoting towards the people who are standing in front of him. St. Peter has never sp spoken much scripture before. But after the dissension of the Holy Spirit, after receiving the Holy Spirit, St. Peter goes on to give a large sermon, an in-depth sermon, a sharp one and a studious one to convict them of the wrong things they did to Jesus. A same man who find it could not stand up to the maid servant that I know him. He could not say that. He said, I don't know Jesus. He denied. But the same St. Peter could able to stand in faith 
to be stand in power accompanied by the power of the holy spirit could able to give such an oratorship a fisherman given the eloquence of speech the same saint peter was given the spirit of wisdom the same saint peter was given the spirit of knowledge the same saint peter was given the spirit of understanding the scripture and to give them the needed conversion in their hearts to because that's why when he finished speaking the bible clearly says they were pricked in their heart and they asked what shall we do and this is how the holy spirit convicts and this is where sorry this is how the holy spirit will give us the interpretation and to be a principal agent of evangelization as we study in the acts of apostles chapter 2 now the third major function of the holy spirit is he strengthens us with his spiritual gifts he strengthens us with spiritual gifts um isaiah chapter 11 verse number 2 please sister and the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the lord praise god amen now as we were just discussing this in st peter's life when the spirit of the lord begin to when he received the holy spirit on the day of pentecost the spirit of the lord could able to give him the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the scripture he gave him the spirit of counsel and my counsel that's why when there was a problem in the rationing of the foods as we study in acts of apostle chapter 6 they were able to give them a very very practical suggestion that they are they are dedicated to give the word ministry to people that's why st stephen and six others were appointed to give the rationing of the food the spirit of counsel give them the direction what do they have to take and he was filled with the spirit of might that means power there is no fear in him that's why he was able to stand before such a big crowd and to give them and the spirit of knowledge the in st peter might not have gone through the scripture at all being a fisherman but that day if you if, when we study acts of apostles chapter 2 an in depth in depth knowledge of the scripture right from the beginning until the end and obviously of course the fear of the lord and this is how he strengthens his people so that's why St Paul often ask us we need to aspire for the spiritual gifts when we aspire for this spiritual gifts they are called the higher gifts when a person aspires for this higher gifts the evangelical gifts automatically adds up but more often in the charismatic renewal more often in the in the renewal of in the renewal churches we are more focused on the evangelical gifts i am not saying it is wrong but more importantly the the spiritual gifts the higher gifts will make us to get rooted in the word this spiritual gifts will always a man a person or a lady filled with the spiritual gifts will be rich in the fruits of the spirit that is one of the fruits you will see in a person if the first if the root is the wisdom from the holy spirit you will see the fruit called fortitude you will see the fruit of self control in them you will see the spirit of love in them and that is where here st pete does the main function of the holy spirit is to aspires to acquire this higher spiritual gift with which we are strengthened in the word 
in the Lord, even when we are being tested in turbulent our trials and tribulations in our life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the other thing, he always makes us to become more like Christ. That is also another function of the Holy Spirit. And he reminds us, no, 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 this is not the way to go. This is how I should reflect Christ in such situations. Even when my husband is so negative, am I to stand for myself? Or am I to be an image of Christ as an ambassador of love? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18, please. Three eighteen, right, brother? Yes, sister, please. Thank you. Sorry. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Praise God. Sister, do you have a... a NRSV version, sister, in this? No, NRSV I don't have, but one minute. I can bring it up on the net. No, no, I, ca I can share. Can I share? Yeah, okay. St. Paul says that, and all of us with un unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to other, for this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit takes the wheel of sin, takes the wheel of fear. He uncovers the veil of inferiority complex. The spirit of the Lord unveils the spirit of offense. He unveils the spirit of negativity. He unveils the spirit of anger, the spirit of worry, so that you and I are able to see the Lord as a reflecting mirror. I am, I am the cry, I am the re reflection of Christ Jesus, that is the example we see in the Good Samaritan. He sheds every of his work. His work is delayed. He takes, he spends his money. He spends his time. He gives his own transportation, the donkey to make him to travel, whereas he was walking. The reflection of Christ Jesus comes there. This can be done only when a person is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And obviously, without Christ, we can never be the witness to Christ. As St. As Saint Peter very clearly said that, and Jesus said to St. Peter, when the power of the Most High comes to you, you will bear witness, not only in Jerusalem, but also in Judea, and not only there to the ends of the earth. Dear Praise brothers God. and sisters, Thank you, Jesus. as we are studying the word, reflecting the word, pondering the word, meditating the word, in all these things, elements, we are always walking with the Holy Spirit. It is walking with the Holy Spirit is something like even when you are cooking, it is you can communicate to him. It is taking the spirit of the Lord in the normal with this taking the Spirit of the Lord in every normal act of your life. It can be your cooking, it can be washing, ironing. This is a normal communication. You can say, Holy Spirit, guide me. What should I have to add for this recipe? It is a making him or enabling us to walk with the Spirit in our daily, day-to-day -day life. It is not a separate time, but walking with the Lord. 
as they emouse they were doing it but they could not identify the word was there but when we have understood the word dear brothers and sisters we can walk with the word it is not only when we are being seated before the lord but you can walk with the lord as enoch did because the spirit of the lord is within us to give the revelation to give the identity to give the sanctification to give the witnessing and to also to strengthen us in every moment and every walk of our life thank you jesus and praise you jesus